dia a todos. Vamos dar início à conferência na área de política da professora Nádia Osinati, já bastante conhecida entre nós, sobretudo pelo seu livro representativo de Nópolis, e que tem também um artigo em português na revista Lua Nova sobre esse mesmo tema, e outros livros que ainda não foram, sobre o nosso livro, certo? Não foram ainda traduzidos em uma porção e uma série enorme de artigos, tanto em inglês como em italiano, em especial o um artigo que está sendo muito discutido nos Estados Unidos, um artigo dela, é, que se chama Conflict for Liberty, de Office Democracy, é, Issue of é, na American Political Science UIB. É, esse artigo é o último artigo dela, ele está sendo bastante polêmico e discutido lá. Bem, sem muitas delongas, né, eu, eu disse então, peço que ela, a professora peça começa a conferência, ela falará em inglês durante 50 minutos para que possamos o professor Cícero falar dois breves comentários sobre a sua fala e depois será aberto ao público para questões. Por isso que eu, um dos 15, já vou começar agora, tá? temos tempo hábil antes do almoço para discutir o que achava conveniente e adequado. Muito obrigada pela presença de todos. Eu passo a palavra, então, à professora Nádia Almeida. Now, in this lecture, I will give you an outline 
of my art, of the main argument of the book, and sketch the general theme of the book. And then, that is, I will give you some ideas what this diary means, and why I talk about this figuration, and then I will concentrate on one disfiguration in particular. The what I call the plebiscite of the audience, or the transformation of democratic citizenship in a politics of facility. Now, why do you say analogy of figure? Figure means the external configuration of a body, the way in which you perceive me. This is my figure. It's nothing to do, and I don't want to talk about the essence of the body. As it has been done inside of the theory of sovereignty, the theory of the state, throughout the years, beginning with the great classical theories that from Plato and Aristotle on. I, I, for me, the problem is the outside. What it appears? Why you can say you are Cicero, uh, you are Nanda? Even if we change, and we change in a way that is visible through time, but we recognize the person. Now, I would like to apply this idea, this analogy, to uh, democracy. Because I think that from outside, we recognize the king. We recognize when there is a tyranny. There are no elections, there is no division of power, there is no deal of right. We see it immediately what it is. So I would like to see things and see this transformation inside of the novel. So the, first, the three disfigurements I uh, studied are the epistemic, that is, the epistemic fear of democracy, which is now very well represented, particularly in the American uh, academia, or the myth that procedures are good because they bring us to a decision that is truthful, correct, and impartial. This is one disfigurement of the diary between opinion and the will, or opinion and institution, because it violates the idea that opinion is instead not a form of truth, is a different, is a, is a way of elaborating views, ideas, with the uh, stipulation that we always can change them. But truth cannot change. Truth is the final station after which there is no change, if it is a truth. Second, we cannot, and this is my uh, very important that we cannot subordinate the value of democratic procedures to the outcome. The outcome meaning the good decisions, because this is a way of devaluating, not evaluating uh, 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 procedures, which are a good in themselves as rules of the game, because they are based on the idea of variation, variety, diversity of opinions, open manifestations of opinions, and open discussions in order to reach a majority that is voting for or against. This is a good in itself because it presumes that each individual counts as one, each citizen counts as one, that we can vote, which means that we are open to the, to the possibility for changing previous decisions. So democracy according to Tocqueville, and I rely upon that, upon this view, Democracy is that system that does not promise to give us good decisions. Sometimes we have bad decisions. Uh, what it promises us is to be open to revisions without changing the system. So it's a permanent system of emendation. And if it is a permanent system of emendation, it is because opinion, not truth, is central. The second configuration I studied is populism. I understand that United, uh, South America or Latin America has a particular good disposition toward populism. I strongly disagree with uh, justifying populism as a good form of democracy, and I think instead that it is a worrisome form of democracy. It's an internal revolution, internal revolution to democracy, but can be uh, problematic because it transforms the opinion 
put off the large majority into the will of the people. So there is a kind of um, mix of uh, institution and opinion and the transformation of the will of the um, great majority or the opinion of the great majority into the very will of the sovereign people. And this is problematic because it is an internal violation of pluralism. It is an internal violation of the idea that democracy is not the sovereignty of the mass, but the sovereignty of the individual citizens, as according to the classical tradition of Aristotle. When Aristotle in politics defines democracy, he defines all the politia, or the constitutional government, he defines it by saying that it is based on the position of each citizen in relation to the other citizens and to the state. It's the individual that is important, because we count those. We don't shout in the square or in the uh, public. We count each vote. This is the recognition of the value of each citizen. The third disfiguration I study, and it's the one that I want here to discuss with you because it is the most pervasive in this moment of it, is the plebiscite of the audience. So since I'm going to dedicated the last part of my lecture to this, uh, let me, before going there, tell you, tell you why uh, representative democracy or the democracy of the moderns as is a dialogue. Why is important is this a dialogue of two sets of powers? I think democracy to be a government by means of opinion. A representative democracy as the, perhaps the best uh, expression of this dialectic system, in which procedures and institutions that regulate decisions give authoritative uh, validity and power to decisions, and on the other hand, a system of opinion formation according to which we can influence the system, criticize decisions and the activity of the leaders or the politicians, change previous decisions, and so on and so forth. So these two forces, these two powers, need to be in a relationship of separation and relation. Separation because uh, we cannot confuse opinion with decisions, nor we can eliminate or be indifferent to opinion and be instead only pregnant to institutions. So the task of democratic procedures is that of two kinds, two, two forms. To allow citizens to play the game of politics and participate either directly or indirectly in the making of decisions, and to claim and trust that the game they are playing is fair. Because it is made with rules and according to conditions that are equal to all and the treat all equally. As you know, I mean, from Habermas. So there is a long tradition, Habermas or Rose, that is uh, in agreement or theorize these conditions is important for that. So democratic decisions are required to be amended with democratic means in according to the procedural organization of the decision-making process. Democracy above all, when it is implemented through elections and through representation, cannot, however, ignore that what citizens think or say when they act in a society, not as electors. It is outside of the public as the place in which authoritative decisions are made. Citizens form their opinions and criticize those who are in power. The public and the expressions of ideas is the condition for all decisions to be formed and changed. And this is a form of participation of active citizenship in representative 
themselves. So citizens thus, they use all the means of information and communication they dispose of in order to manifest their presence, something that is no less valuable than the procedures and the institutions, although, as I said, they don't command any limit. So the challenge awaiting representative democracy comes from precisely the fact that although institutions and opinions cannot be truly separated, they need to operate separately and be and remain different. We don't want our political opinions to be downplayed or silenced in the name of competent opinions of the expert or the impartial opinion of the judge. We don't want that. And we don't want the opinion of the majority to become one and the same thing, as I said before, with the will of the And we don't want that our opinions become a passive reaction to what the leaders put on the space. So, that representative democracy is governed by opinion entails that the public forum keeps state power open to criticism and moreover is public. Public for two reasons. Because the law imposes that is performed under people's eye and because it is not owned by anybody. As left forward, closer forward is to say the location and possession disappear in the formation of modern conception of political so, as you can see, DOXA opinion plays three roles. Cognitive, to know, information, knowledge. Political, expression of views in order to criticize and play arguments against or pro. Aesthetic, to see, to have a as a public, to see what the people, what the leaders do. So the form of opinion is meant to diffuse information, check and monitor institutions, express public dissent and criticism, and see what politicians do. So these three roles must be uh, recognized and uh, all of them important. The three configurations are discussed they tend instead to radicalize one of them respectively. So the epistemic, the economic, the populist, the political, the traditional and the aesthetic. Why public opinion or the sphere of political of formation of political opinions is important in representative democracy? Recall that in the mid 19th century, John Stuart Mill wrote that the means of communication would be able to recreate a large, in large societies that kind of proximity in national conversation that ancient republics enjoyed by having citizens gathered together in one assembly and directly interact with the agora or the form. A century after me, Jürgen Habermas, in 1962, wrote that the public forum is essential to democracy, yet on condition it remains public, pluralistic, and autonomous from private interest of all sorts. In a very important way, he depicted the acclamation styles that can characterize the public sphere in mass democracy. This is the book, The Transformation of the Public Sphere, translated in the uh, written in 62. So the issue seems to pertain that and the problem today to democracy, they don't come from the level of institutions perhaps, or the, but from these other domains, the domain of opinion formation. In which sense? Because the issue is not today so much how to 
protect freedom of expression from the power of the state. We are to your practice. Anyway, if there is a violation or attempt to violation, there is an immediate reaction. We have division of power, force, and monitor. We know that. The real problem is instead how the public form of ideas can succeed in remaining a public good. Thus, play is monitoring, cognitive, and dissenting role if video power affects politics so radically, and if, as John Dunn and Giovanni Sartori wrote, if the information industry, I quote, in many different parts of the world belongs to a relatively small number of private individuals. So in a world, a, a, state, a, a state today is not freedom of speech as the right of the individual, but freedom of speech as the right of the citizen. It's paresia, those who know about a Greek uh, history of politics. Paresia, this, this right to express and power speaking, not simply the right to speak. So in a political arena in which an acclamation to remove the chance to predominate and private corporations occupy the public forums, uh, some scholars have suggested it should be difficult. It is difficult, I'm sorry. It is difficult to prevent, I quote from Eden Baker, to prevent the very scoring effect, which is a real issue. It's not simply a phenomenon of an isolated country. It's a real issue. Now, remember that other scholars, they, found, they point to another kind of phenomenon related to information. Cass Sunstein has written recently that the internet, in fact, produces a formidable dispersal of information. It doesn't produce concentration, but dispersal of information, and tends also to create aggregation of millions around views that are endorsed by imitation and bloggers identification. So a kind of uh, balkanization uh, of the opinion uh, and, and, and uh, information, uh, the opinion system through uh, these new media. So this phenomenon, along with the decline of electoral participation, their own political party, and the fragmentation of the, public, of the public into these niches of private opinions are intertwined phenomena that they have to make us worry about the figure of democracy, the appearance of democracy today. Now, why do we need this public sphere of opinion? And why do we want this public sphere of opinion remain public. Now, Giovanni Sartori wrote years ago that voting is what counts in democracy. And that citizens don't learn how to vote by voting. We make mistakes all the time. We, we vote wrongly all the time. No matter, he says, how rich, articulated, and open is the arena of discussion, this does not change the arbitrary character of voting. It does not make us more competent in voting. So then why do we insist so much in having free, public, pluralistic arena of opinion? Is it because we aim at some outcome in particular? Like for instance, competent, or true decision? I don't think so. The theory of democracy as a directly is keen to embrace a procedural rather than substantive view of or outcome view of democracy. That, that, that is, it is not for the sake of achieving some desirable outcomes that it is important that democracy relies upon an unlimited, robust, and wide open public debate, but for the sake of enjoying and protecting our equal political liberty. It is very normal, uh, not consequential. So first, so a free
free and public phone is a sign of political liberty and it is a good in and by itself. First, because the chance of contesting and controlling a regime rises to the extent that citizens' opinions are not confined within their private minds, but are public. Second, because it is consonant with the character of democracy as a political system that is based on and engenders dispersion of power, not concentration of power. So the equal opportunity citizens have to take part in the formation and the expression of political opinion, in the exercise of their political influence on institutions, and the quality of the public forum of ideas are intertwined and essential components of our political leadership. They are principal factors, much like the right to vote. And they don't need empirical evidence. We don't need to prove that thanks to information and communication, then we will have good decisions. There is no proof needed. These are principles in a democracy. Indeed, an open forum of opinions is essential even if we don't learn to vote by voting. Even if an open, wide, robust public debate gives us no guarantee that we will achieve good or rational or correct decisions. And even if information does not translate in knowledge. So, I, in this sense, I, I agree and I argue with Roberto Bobbio that norms and procedures, the rules of the game, are primary goods. We have to consider in a normative context of the norm. They are primary goods. Now, because of its dialectic character, democratic government should be engaged in an effort to guard all the opportunity that citizens have to participate in the making of this informal sovereign, the sovereign of opinion. Since there is an avoidable, an avoidable link between public opinion and political decisions, concern about the disproportionate possibility of the wealthiest or the more socially powerful to influence election and electors and government this is a problem we have to be attentive to and guard again. Empirical research proves this concern is, is well posed when this empirical research demonstrates how economic inequality and political inequality are mutually enforcing with the result that wealth tends to entrench rather than distribute power over time. And it does so by also owning, organizing the media and the system of communication, not simply operating over the institution. 